Hello everyone, welcome back to Writer's Book Club. For those of you who are new to the podcast, hello, my name is Michelle Barakoff and this podcast is all about writing craft and process. So each month I do a deep dive into a novel with the author of that novel. And this month I had the absolute pleasure of talking to Alison Tate about her new middle grade novel, The First Summer of Callie McGee. I can't believe I'm up to season three and haven't yet done a middle grade novel. So sorry, all you middle grade novelists, but I'm definitely making it up to you with this interview because who better to talk to about middle grade writing than Alison Tate? This is her ninth middle grade novel and it's such a great read and it's a quick read, right? Only 40,000 words. So if you're wanting to write for that eight to 12 age group, this is an excellent novel to read and study along with this episode for a mini masterclass in middle grade writing. So Elle and I talk about novel openings, uh, pacing, what she included and excluded to make the novel age appropriate, um, how she balanced the character arcs with the external plot. I'm always interested in that. The difference between a child-led versus a parent-led purchase when it comes to crafting a kid's book. So something I'd never thought of, actually. Elle also talked about her theory on having a writing age. And in the spirit of her hundreds of interviews with other authors over over at the So You Want to Be a Writer podcast with Valerie Koo, I asked her for her top tips on writing middle grade novels. So the first summer of Callie McGee is a contemporary cozy crime. Think modern day Trixie Belden or Famous Five set on the south coast of New South Wales. They were the kind of books I loved to read as a kid, so this was particularly sweet for me. Let me tell you a little bit about the novel. It's the last summer before Callie starts high school and she's been dragged along to yet another family friend's holiday. Determined to change her nerdy reputation, Callie sets out to make waves, but nothing is quite as she expects. Her usual ally, Sasha, has outgrown Callie. So Callie's 12, 13, Sasha's 15. Callie's nemesis Mitch has brought his cousin Owen along and the boring south coast town of Sawyer's Point has been rocked by a series of burglaries. Callie, Owen and Mitch decide to investigate the robberies, bringing them face to face with a local gang and a possible ghost. But when Sasha goes missing, Callie must draw on all her smarts to find her friend and discovers that being Callie McGee has its benefits. So as well as having that mystery element that kids love, Al has written characters that kids, I think, can really relate to. I mean, I certainly did. So it's got that perfect blend for middle grade stories. For those of you who don't know about Alison Tate, let me tell you about her. She writes under the name of A.L. Tate, and she's the internationally published best-selling author of middle grade adventure series, The Mapmaker Chronicles, The Ataban Cipher Novels, and The Maven and Reeve Mysteries. Al is also a multi-genre writer, creative writing teacher, and speaker with many years experience in magazines, newspapers, and online publishing. She is also the co-host of the top rating Your Kids Next Read podcast. I hope you enjoy this deep dive writing chat with the fabulous Alison Tate. Alison Tate, hello and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I love the idea of being part of a book club. So I'm just, I'm totally on board for this. And a writer's book club at that, where we don't just talk about the themes, we we get into the nitty gritty of the writing. Right. I'm ready. I'm ready for my interrogation. I am in the hot seat. Awesome. I feel like I've had you in my ears for so many years, Al. This is quite a surreal experience for me, having you on the other end of the mic. I have to tell you, I Uh, and I have said this many times in my life, but I much prefer to be on your side of the conversation than on my side of the conversation. I just always find the asking of the questions so much easier than the answering of the questions. Yes. And yet you are so good at both. So, you know, after all these years, after all these years and all these books. So this is your ninth novel, correct? That's correct. This is my ninth published novel for children, which is very exciting. Um, It's actually my 13th, I think, uh, published book. I have several non-fiction books published and a couple of ghost-written titles that I can't talk about or, you know, there would be dire consequences. Um, And I have actually written in the past uh, novels for adults, but at this stage and probably forevermore, they remain um, unpublished. So, you know, I've written a lot of words. I stood up in a school last week and someone said to me, how many words? (laughs) I always love these questions. Um, This little girl put her hand up and she's like, how many words do you think you've written in your life? And I was like, 
I just, you know, you start to calculate the number of books and then you start to think about the fact that you were a, you know, a uh, journalist for many years and I had a blog and I, we're into the millions. And they were just looking at me like, how is that even possible? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, that reminds me. I started following you in the Pink Fibro days. Did you? That's a long time ago. I had a little blog because I went through this whole IVF thing and I had a blog and then I was looking for other people who were talking about parenting and creativity and all that sort of stuff. And I found you, God knows how, but you know. In my pink fibro. In the pink fibro when we were all on Blogger or whatever we were on, the sort of old platforms. And that's how before social media, we used to all comment on each other's blogs. and We did. Oh my gosh. It was a wonderful network though. I Look, I loved, like blogging for me was really important for a couple of reasons. Um, I didn't want to do it. A friend of mine told me I had to. I was working still, you know, a lot as a freelance journalist at that stage and I had two small children and I, you know, like I I was just so busy and uh, a dear friend of mine said, you need to start a blog. And I'm like, why would I write for free? And she was like, well, because this is the way things are going. Like you've got to start building yourself a profile. And um, and anyway, I, I, you know, we fought about that for a while and then she finally convinced me to do it. And I think the thing that blogging gave me in many ways was a, a way into my own intimate writing voice um, in a way that writing for magazines and um, newspapers did not. There was very much a broadcast aspect to that style of writing and you you write to fit a publication and, you know, you're doing your own thing, but you you're, you also know who you're writing for. And, um, and I think what blogging gave me after a little while, like once I, you know, I used to read my first blog posts and just laugh hysterically, um, it gave me that notion of um, finding my own way and my own writing voice because when you write daily, as I was at that stage, I was writing every single day. I had to sit down every day and just find something to write about. And so, I was writing about tiny things and they were becoming, you know, bigger stories and um, it sort of just, it really allowed me, it was like keeping a journal online, I realise. Um, and I, I'd never really kept a journal before. And so, I, I was able to just really dive back, bring my my close voice back and that's when I found my fiction writing voice much more so than my, in my broadcast voice. Do you think there's still a place for blogging? You know, people are thinking about writing children's books or adult books even. Do you think there's still a place for blogging for people to sort of practice their daily writing I think there is. Um, I think it's one of those things where there's always a place for for that sort of writing. There's always going to be a place for it. Blogging has changed a lot over the years. My blog today looks, I mean, I still keep a blog, but it it looks nothing like it used to. It's much more... um, it's much more sort of newsy or eventsy or I do a lot of writing tips and advice and I have a lot of stuff on there for my Your Kids Next Read podcast. And so it's changed a lot over the years, but I still do it. And the reason I do it is it uh, it brings people to my website, which is really, really important. Um, I still think it's an important part of networking, although it, not, as, not like it used to be. Because I think the second thing that blogging gave me, apart from that intimacy of voice, was exactly what you talked about. Like we were all going around writing comments on each other's blogs. And I met so many. I met Megan Daly, who is my my podcast co-host. I met her through blogging. Um, and just so many people that I am still, you know, in touch with Um 10, 12, you know, years later, um, I met them through that process of us all sharing our thoughts online. I do think that there is a place for it. What I find now is that people tend to do their blogging in micro form on Instagram or on Facebook, um, which, which is definitely, you know, a valid thing to do. But your website, your blog is it's what you own on the internet. It's your space. No one can take it away. I mean, as we've seen with Twitter, you can build a huge profile somewhere and then if it changes overnight, like Twitter almost did, that just disappears in seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the only thing you really have is what you build yourself. And so for me, that website and that blog is important. And because I have such a deep blog, like it just goes back for centuries, it feels like, um, the search engine optimization, even though I know nothing about search engine optimization, um, just the keywords and the fact that I have been consistently producing content all these years, um, I get a huge amount of traffic just without even 
having to think about it. And yes, they come for certain aspects, but I have make sure that there's a footer on every single blog post that says, hi, are you new here? This is who I am. This is what I do. This is where you can find out about my books, you know, and it's just, it's a way of of introducing people into my world um, without having to stand on a street corner waving a placard all the time. And I I think there's a lot of value in that because I'm not a major placard waver at all. (laughs) We could go. Oh, we could go down so many rabbit holes there, Al. On we could, we could. Well, we're not here to. We're, we're not here to talk about that, are we? We're supposed to be talking about my book. Oh, I forgot about that. You're right. I, blogging is brilliant for SEO. Consistent yeah. blogging is brilliant for SEO and author platform, all that sort of stuff. Very, very important. But we have it's gone a whole off. different conversation. <laughs> We've gone off already on tangents. This was always going to be the case, and this is the trouble. You know, when I'm not in charge of the questions, we can go anywhere. It's the things. Things go always go a little bit awry. What can okay. I say? We are here to talk about the first summer of Callie McGee, your beautiful new middle grade novel that I just inhaled in a day. I loved it. That's the other beauty of middle grade fiction for hours. You can just rip that through that thing in a day. (laughs) (laughs) That's so nice. This is my shortest book ever. This is 40,000 words. Like it's like, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very um, short, it's short and sweet. And I really love it from that perspective. Oh, it's very sweet. And yet you've packed so much in, as I said to you earlier, it's such a layered novel and I want to talk to you about that. So, Al, tell us where the initial idea for this book came from and how you built on that to become a novel-worthy premise, so to speak. That's a really good question. So the germ of this idea was actually about six or seven years ago um, and it came from a place, which is an unusual thing for me. Um, So it came from a place and it came from a holiday house that I used to spend time in, in a holiday village on the South Coast called Jaroa. And it belonged to some family friends of ours. And we just, it was just my happy place. We used to love going there. It was just this dodgy old 1970s double story brick joint, you know, nothing fancy, no Airbnb aspect to it at all, except for this epically amazing view um, off the back deck, which was out over the ocean, over Blackhead, um, which is the the sort of headland there at at Jaroa. But it's one of those places where if you sit on the back deck, you're looking at grass going down to rocks and straight into the ocean. And if you look up to the left, the, the dairy farm at the top of the hill goes all the way to the cliffs and then straight down into the ocean. So you're looking up and there's cows on the hill on the grass. Then you've got this, you know, rock and then you've got this ocean. So I was sort of like, I'd been going there for years. And when I was writing even the Mapmaker Chronicles, which I wrote in sort of 2013, 2012, 2013, I, I wrote parts of that series at this house because I was able to sit on this deck and stare out across just this massive expanse of ocean. And I could sort of like think about being seasick like Quinn, you know, I was sort of on the deck. Um, and so they um, these dear friends of ours that, that owned it, it was a family sort of a place and they they sold it in 2017 um, or t- the end of 2016. And, um, and I said to them at the time, I said, I am going to write a book set in this place because the feeling of being there was something that I just wanted to hold on to and we had had such an amazing time there. And so I, I promised them that I was going to write this book one day and I was going to dedicate the book to them and I have done that. So my dear friends, Ray and Faye Kent, um, have the the dedication in this book. Unfortunately, Ray actually passed away a couple of years ago, so he was not here to see the book. I have this feeling that he's probably laughing at me somewhere like for having, you know, it having taken so long because every time I saw him, he'd go, where's my book? Where's my book, Al? Where's my book? (laughs) It's here, Ray. I'm telling you, it's here. So it sort of started with this place and then I actually drafted, I did, I wrote the first draft in 2017 and it was because it was, I wanted to write a mystery story. Um, At that stage, I hadn't written the Maven and Reeve detective stories. This was actually the first mystery I ever wrote. And I wanted to write something that reminded me of the books that I read when I was a, a kid. I loved Famous Five and Trixie Belden and I loved everything in my books. You know, people say, this is such a departure for you, Alison. It's a contemporary novel. And and it is in the setting, but the themes remain the same. It is adventure. It is um, mystery. It is groups of kids solving problems together. Um, and it is that sort of sense of, of working out what's going on with you. So, if you read any of my novels, that's exactly what's going on in all of them. And um, so, I sat down to write this book and 
I was I, I knew I wanted to explore this family friends idea as well because every kid has had this experience like you're looking for that universality and I we used to go to this house and the parents loved each other and we would all be there sort of like having the best time and just sort of being generally embarrassing because that's what you do, right? Um, and then there'd be all these kids there of various ages who were just expected to get on with it. Like you would just, the parents are off doing their thing and reliving their memories and having a lovely time. And the kids are all just sort of there in the middle of it trying to figure out, you know, who's who in the zoo and, and what's going on. And so, Callie comes from a little bit from myself, from my own experiences of those family sort of holidays, um, but also from observing my own boys in the mix, you know, in the midst of all this, you know, and and my older son in particular is, you know, quite uh, introverted and it takes him a little while to warm up. And so, um, you know, watching him sort of like finding his way in this overwhelming melee of children um, was quite interesting to me because it's also the way I feel when I go into those big group situations. It always takes me a little while to figure out where I am and what's going on. So when I was thinking about this, I wanted it to be a family holiday, you know, family friends holiday. I wanted it to be in this beach house. I wanted it to be in this holiday village feel. Um, and then, of course, what you do as a writer is you just think, well, who can I bring into this that is going to be the most uncomfortable person in this group? And so, Callie um, sort of appeared and she was waving at me. And the first scene that came to my mind was actually not the opening as it sits now, but it was her looking into the mirror in the bathroom of the holiday house, wondering out loud if she can be CJ McGee. She wants to change her name. So her full name is Calliope Jean Marie McGee, McGee, which as her friend points out is a lot of name for a little person. Um, and she's trying to figure out if she can reinvent herself into this very cool person who's going to be called CJ McGee. And I just had this vision of her looking at herself um, you know, trying to, she's desperately wanting to be someone else, like desperately wanting to be someone different and wanting to go to high school and leave behind this sort of nerdy self that she's, you know, that she is. She's bookish and she's, you know, she's not popular and she wants to be more confident. And yeah, as soon as I saw that little face, I just knew that I had had my character. And so then I do, I did what every writer does. I, I followed her into the story. And, you know, before we knew it, poor old Callie was, you know, wrapped up in this mystery and trying to solve burglaries and, and you know, throwing herself into rips. And she was having a terrible time, but awesome for me as a writer, because she's just so uncomfortable the whole way through the story. <laughs> I mean, when I was reading it, it took me straight back as well to those, actually, this is very meta, but reading Trixie Belden and the Famous Five on family holidays. Exactly which is what we were all doing. We used to go with our cousins and our aunties and uncles and, again, the big group of kids all running yep. around. And I also loved how when I was reading that, I can now see it from the parents' point of view as well, you know, getting yep. cranking up the tunes, having a few yep. cocktails on the deck. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and just, you know, the dads are sort of all becoming 19 yep. again and throwing themselves into these rugby scrums and Callie's <laughs> just standing there looking at them going, oh, how did we get here? You know, what's going on? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it was, look, it, it was a great uh, fun, you know, thing to write, but it was also really, you know, very personal too, because I think that you have a writing age, like as a children's author, you have a writing age. Every, everyone says, you know, you've got this age, whatever age it is that that was sort of like a big transition period for you is going to be sort of where your voice sits. And for me, it's middle grade because um, I remember so vividly being that age, I remember how incredibly uncomfortable I was for so many years trying to figure out you know, what was going on. Being this bookish person, you read a lot of stuff, you know a lot of stuff. And so, you've kind of got this slightly older perspective of the world, but you're still very young and you're so vulnerable and you're so incredibly, horribly self-conscious about everything. I think I still am that age now that I think about it. <laughs> I think Me I'm too. Still that. Yeah. I still um, want to hide away in the, in the no, bedroom that, with a book exactly, on holidays. <laughs> exactly. And when I, like, so when I was 10, we moved from the Northern Territory to this to the south coast of New South Wales, so not far from where this actual story is set. And I, um, it was a big, big 
move for me. Like I had by that stage, I'd gone to five primary schools. I washed up in this one, you know, on the south coast of New South Wales. Everyone had known each other. I think they all went to preschool together. Like it was all, you know, probably, I don't know, they were all born in the same hospital. Who knows? But they, they, there was just the groups were very fixed. I turned up. I was very much like feeling like a total outsider because it was a culture shock. I'd gone from, you know, Alice Springs to surf culture, which just, you know, I'm a – I'm a freckle-faced redhead, you know, surf culture and I do not get on. Um, so I was kind of there and so we had this new house and then I got a new brother as well. So my brother is 10 years younger than I was and so suddenly I've got this new baby, I'm sharing a room with my sisters, I'm just like – it was like just – big you know the so the whole period there from about 10 to 14 for me was epic and the, I'm pretty sure that's why I write where I write because it's you know you are on the cusp at that point of the biggest adventure you ever go on which is growing up and it's it's a real it's a real moment and I love middle grade readers because they will go anywhere with you if you give them a good enough reason you know, you want dragons, you can have dragons. You want unicorns, you can have unicorns. You can do whatever you want as long as it makes sense in the world that you create for them. And um, I absolutely love that. They're so enthusiastic. Yeah. And I bet the school tours that you've been doing for Book Week lately, you're getting some lovely feedback about this book because they could probably see themselves in this they can, and I, I definitely am. And they love the cover because it's got that real beachy summer escape feel. Like I'm really hoping it's going to end up on a lot of Christmas, you know, holiday lists. I would love them to be lying in a beach house somewhere reading this book and just going, oh, yes, this is exactly what it's like yes. because that's – you You want that book. You know, there's always going to be a book that just – the right book at the right time that speaks to you. And um, I just hope that for, you know, for someone out there who's – struggling with this whole idea of wanting to be someone else, that this is the book that will help them understand that actually being yourself is okay. Yeah, yeah. so hot tip, everyone. Get that out on your socials to all of your <laughs> friends. Absolutely. With kids, what, 10 to 14-ish, Al? Yeah, well, it's actually, this one is uh, is uh, very firmly in that, in the middle grade space of 8 to 12. So mm-hmm. because it is a scholastic title and so it goes into the book fairs and so you've got a lot of kids coming along with the 10 bucks that their mum, you know, or their grandma gave them for the book fair, um, we it's very much a child-led purchase. And so when it's a child-led purchase, you have to make sure that whatever they're picking up is definitely in the space that you say it is. So there's nothing troubling. Like there's, there's you know, there's some themes and there's some challenging ideas in it, but there's nothing – um, that is going to be problematic for them in any way, shape or form. So I think that's I think that's really important as well in middle grade because, you know, some of my other books uh, like Maven and Reeve, um, they're, they're slightly older. There's marriages, there's political intrigue, there's all sorts of things going on, um, whereas this one is definitely 8 to 12. It's interesting that you say that and I will get to this later when we're talking about the editing, but there was a moment in the book where I thought, so the older character, Sasha, Mm. goes down to the beach with some older boys Mm. and I thought, "Uh oh, what's going to happen here? Mm. And I don't know if you had other ideas about how that might go and what she might have to, she might have got herself into a situation that she just wasn't able to get herself out Mm of. And then you pulled it back to Mm -hmm. something that was less, adult or grown up or out of young adult territory back into the grade. So it never, so that particular scene that you're talking about was the most difficult scene for me to write in the whole book because I wanted it to have the menace and I wanted it to have that peak peer pressure feeling because the peer pressure is what makes Sasha do what she does. She's also in her own way trying to be someone else and trying to be more and trying to be older and trying to be all the things um, and she gets in over her head. Now, when I first drafted that scene, um, because, you know, I, as I say, I'm from the South Coast, I know what beach parties look like and so when I first drafted it, I wrote it very much as a as a, as a beach scene. So, again, it was never overtly going to stray into YA territory, but there were cars on the beach, there were um, bottles, bottles mentioned, that was all. And what the, the, the particular, you know, sort of situation with Sasha was, was never um, – going to be overtly, you know, sexual or go into YA, but there was this understanding that what was happening to her at the time was not something that she was, 
you know, comfortable with or happy with. Um, so when I talked to Laura Siva King, who was my publisher at Scholastic, we discussed that scene endlessly, um, and we ended up changing the the challenging aspect of it slightly, as you said, to wind it back a little bit. Um, we turned it into a, a dare that put her in physical harm, um, in the sense of you know she's walking out on the rocks towards the ocean in the middle of the night, you know, trying to do this dare that all the locals do, um, and she's you know a city girl and she doesn't really know what she's got herself into and it's it's not great and she doesn't feel like because you know we've all been in that situation as as a you know 14 year old because she's 14 nearly 15 and she she's got herself into this situation where she is doesn't want to back down because she doesn't want to lose face she wants to you know she's she's told them all how cool she is and she doesn't want to not be that and it's a difficult situation to be in when you're that age because you don't really have that sort of skill set of oh, how do I get myself out of this mess you know that I've got myself into it's very hard at that age to go actually I've changed my mind I'm going home now um so Callie comes along and sees what is going on and because of something she's read, um, and this is, you know, it's a bit of a love letter to literature, this book, <laughs> because <laughs> of something she's read, she has an idea of what she can do to sort of dis dissipate the situation a little bit um, and so she she kind of dives on in. But it's an interesting, you know, she, she dives into two situations in this book that she where she's, you know, more or less over her head a little bit. Um, in one of them, she does know what she's doing because she is a, has been doing life-saving training and she understands, you know, what she's doing. In this particular situation, the only reason she's got any idea of what's going on or what, she, you know, what she's even going to do is because of something that she's read. And so I think it... Um, you know, you, you write these stories and you don't necessarily put those things to your subconscious is an extraordinary place. You don't necessarily put those things together. You don't consciously think, well, I don't because, you know, if I was a sensible person, I would have a plan and a conscious thought, but I don't consciously do that. Famously um, a so, pencil, aren't you, Al? Absolutely. So I am just like, I am just relying on that subconscious to drag these things together for me by the end of the book. Um, and so usually I get to the end of my first draft and go, oh, so that's what happened. <laughs> Interesting. It was very um, clever the way you made something she'd read in a book her, you know, the thing that helped her sort of become the hero of the day or the but night. It, as- yeah, but it's one of those things too, isn't it, that, you know, I, I always say when I go to school talks, you know, I, I, I'm always saying to them, you know, words in equals words out. And if you, the more you read, the more you know, and knowledge is power. And it you'd never, ever know where something that you know is going to come in handy. And so, like, I guess that's that's what happens in this in this particular scene. But, yeah, so to, in answer to your initial question, there was a lot of thought that went into that scene to make it definitely fit that 8 to 12 age group because, um, my, as I said, my other books are more in that sort of 10 to 14. They go, they go a little higher. And so when I originally wrote this book, that's where, that's where I was going with it. Um, but... When uh, I was talking to Laura about it, I, we realised that it, it was going to work better in 8 to 12 and I was able to do it by only make – I had to make a couple of small adjustments and it worked really well. So it yeah. was good. Because a 12-year-old might be grappling with, say, a first kiss, but an 8-year-old mm. definitely – well hopefully isn't so you have no, that's of, right yeah. yeah and so the and and you know I'd loved absolutely loved writing the relationship between Callie and Owen for that reason because it's there's never any suggestion of anything except you know he holds her hand at one point and she's all like oh he's holding my hand sort of thing it's incredibly sweet but there is I think you also get the idea between them that you know there could be a serious crush here. I really enjoyed writing that that relationship between them. I thought it was a really nice way to to go about it, like just that frisson of yes. mm, maybe yes, <laughs> yes, which uh, bodes well for maybe book two, book three, book four, book five, and so on and so forth. Oh, someone will, you know, there was some twelve year old girl going to come up to me at school at a school visit and go, "Do they get married?" <laughs> Just, probably just not. waiting. Kelly's got a few things to do before she gets to that point. <laughs> I think so, including get to a legal age. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs>
So how did the process of writing the novel roll out for this one, Al? Was it similar to the other novels? Yes. Now, this is where I would say to you, you know, I do a 20,000 word spreadsheet and I outline all of my characters and I know exactly what's going to happen. Um so the first summer of Callie McGee, I had the idea about the family friends holiday. I knew what the setting was. I, I changed the setting, obviously. I've taken a place I know and I've made it new. Um, and I think that's because, you know, I started to write it and I realised that writing a story in the real world is actually incredibly restrictive um, for someone who has been writing fantasy novels all this time. Um, so because in a fantasy novel you can – and people say to me, oh, it must be so hard to invent a world from scratch. And and in some ways it, it is, but in some ways it's so much easier because it's you're free to do what you like. You can you can do anything you want as long as it, it makes sense. Um, but in the real world, it actually has to make sense full stop. And, you know, so you don't have to explain how a phone works. You know, but someone answers the phone, everybody knows that. So, you know, in in um the fantasy novels, you could explain everything, how everything happens, and what you know, how they get water and what they're eating and all that sort of stuff. So you don't have to go to that sort of level, um, but you have to make sure the technology makes sense. You have to make sure that the slang makes sense. You have to – there's just – it's more restrictive. So I took Jeroa and I turned it into Sawyer's Point and I made it uh, – I gave it, a, you know, a ghost story that it doesn't have and I extended the beach by two miles and I moved the shop and I popped a surf club in there that doesn't exist. Um, so I turned it into its own place and that that gave me the freedom to sort of move things around. So my friends have read the book and they recognise everything about it. They recognise the house, they recognise where it is um, and they just laughed about all the things that I moved. So anyone who lives in Jeroa will recognise it, but to me it's Sawyer's Point. It's just, you know, it's a whole new world. Also, more broadly, it's every surf town on every coast of Australia. Yes. Exactly. And it's summer and it's overcrowded and the locals can't park and so they're cranky yeah. and it's, you know, it's all of that sort of stuff. So everyone's been there. It's ice cream. It's sand in your toes. It's all of that stuff. So I had the place that I wanted. I had Callie and I I just, and I knew that she was wrestling with this idea of who she was. The name stuff for me is just very much an outward um, symbol of that, of that re- internal wrestle that she has. I love names. I always have. Um, I'm always fascinated by, I meet kids, you know, I'll go to schools and I'll meet a kid who's in in sort of, he's in year three and his name's Rocket. And I go home and I say, what if Rocket wants to be an accountant? What happens then? You know, like I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm always thinking about, about how your name affects you and, and stuff. So for me, it was just a really nice external symbol of her internal wrestle. Um, And so, yeah, I sort of, I had her in this, in this place. She's desperate to reinvent herself it's incredibly hard to reinvent yourself when you are surrounded by people who know you really well like I'm like how am I going to make this as hard as possible she's you know these are people who've noticed since she was a baby so when she comes out and announces that she's you know going to be Callie now not Calliope Jean all they want to talk to her about is you know how she went at school and what book she's read like she's got nothing else going for her and they all she thinks they underestimate you know who she can be and that makes her behave out of character so which was great because then I knew I had some scope to work with with her um and then you know the mystery was always going to be part of it and I knew that it was going to be something to do with because of where I was writing I I knew it was going to be something fairly innocuous like it wasn't going to be a murder and it wasn't going to be you know anything too awful so the holiday house break-ins is definitely also a symptom of you know coastal life um so you know from that point I was off and away and it was um and I, I just you know again followed her through the story through this development of her relationship with with Owen and this point where you know she and Mitch get to be you know not as adversarial as they always have been she's very confused by Sasha the older girl because they were friends and now they're not because Sasha's jumped up and it's a jump you know 14 to you know when you're nearly 15 compared to nearly 13 that's a big jump and having watched my boys grow through that I'm sort of you know I'm just drawing on all of the things that I'm seeing and hearing and in the same way that you write any novel um and I just push forward until I get to an end point 
and I have some horrible moments along the way where I'm thinking, what am I doing with my life? And then I, uh, and then I finish the story and then I go back and I edit because for me, the first draft is me figuring out how, what's going to happen and who everyone is. It's almost like a really extended outline. <laughs> um, and I always underwrite. So my first drafts are very, you know, always much shorter than the actual end draft will be. And then I go back and I and I start. So when I went back and did the the, the sort of the first major edit, I realised that as I always invariably do, I'd started in the wrong place. So I, you know, so in this case though, normally I have to take five thousand words off the start. This time I had begun a bit too far into the story. I needed to go back a little bit. Um, so I wrote the scene where she's arriving in the driveway and sort of thinking about the holiday house and. Um, yeah, and then I'm sort of developing the ideas as, as I go through with that second edit and layering in. That's where I put description of the setting and things like that because setting's an interesting thing. I'm always marking it as I go through um, a first draft, um, but it's it's in the second draft where I'm bringing out the setting a bit more. I don't want chunks of setting. I don't want chunks of description in a middle grade novel. I want I want it to be really woven through the text so that you know exactly where they are and what it looks like without having to wade through five paragraphs about how beautiful the trees were. Like it's, you know, it's that sort of thing. Um, so I'm always making sure that that's clear, that the characterization is clear. I always forget to put in what people are wearing and what they you know, it's just like um, I'm just assuming everyone can see them in my head like I can. Uh, so that sort of first edit is is quite a big edit for me. Speaking of openings, I would love to know how important is an opening? Why was the place where you initially started not the opening? And what was the thought process that led you to the actual opening? What did you have to do? So the, the original opening was the scene where she is um so it's actually not 5000 words it's probably only 3 or 400 words earlier that i started um but i had begun with the scene where she's in the bathroom and she's having a conversation with sasha the older girl about how she wants to be cj and sasha's telling her that there's just no way that she's cj like sorry mate that this not not going to happen you know and she's like saying well i could be a cj i could learn to be one and sasha's like no you don't learn to be cj <laughs> you either you either are or you're not you know it's that kind of it's the kind of conversation you have with someone who's you know two years older and eight years cooler than you are sort of thing um so i'd started with that and i realized that i just hadn't set I had, in this case, not set the scene enough. Like, it, it was going to take way too much back and forth retrospective dis description of where she was and what she was doing and how she'd got there. And I realised that I needed to start at the point where she arrives at the holiday, that the holiday begins and so does she. Um, so, I changed it to the, you know, the car pulling up in the driveway of the house. She's looking at this house and, you know, she's a very thoughtful girl. Like, she's thinking you know, a lot because she's a big reader. Again, it's that feeding into that sort of thing. So she's a very thoughtful girl and she's looking at this house and she's thinking about all of the people that have lived their lives inside this house, you know, and all the things that have happened and, you know, um, beyond her sort of family group, which goes there for a week every single year, there's all these other people that are also living their lives in this house and what does it mean? Because um, she's sitting in the car refusing to get out until her mother calls her Callie. Like that's, so, so we get this internal narrative at the same time this action is is sort of playing out where she's not she will not get out of the car until her mother, you know, decides that she can leave Calliope Jean behind. Um, and it just, for me, it set up the relationship between the mum and her as well. Mum is, you know, slightly anxious. Mum is a little bit me. Um, mum has made her swim 18 kilometres of squads, you know, for her whole life because mum wants her to be able to handle herself in the water. Mum has made her go to nippers. And this is exactly what I did to my children because uh, we live down here on the South Coast and the beaches can be wild. And I always said to them, um, you're going to be 15 one day. And this is like, this is how far ahead I think. You're going to be 15 one day and you're going to want to go to the beach by yourself. And I'm only going to be happy with you doing that if I know that you can swim a kilometre and you know how to get in and out of a rip. Yep. 
<laughs> I've done the same so, with my kids. Exactly. Yeah. And they both got completely tortured for years over that. And like I had moments where I'd be standing on the beach at Nippers and, you know, as I said, it's pretty wild down here. And the surf would be massive and it would be freezing and these little skinny boys would be standing there going, do we really have to do this, mum? Yes, you do. In you go, you know. And I've got them out there doing something that I would not in 8 million years do myself. And I'm standing there thinking, is this good parenting or bad parenting? Um, So I think I've kind of drawn a little bit on that for Callie's mum as well um but you know it's a useful thing because Callie can do stuff um she's yes she's bookish um she's a bit like my son Joe bookish but yes he can swim a kilometer to save you if he has to and I I I really liked that um blend of things for her because it gives her gives her the ability to be heroic when she needs to be you know but also it's about creating a more well-rounded character, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. No character is just a two-dimensional bookish character. I mean, that's no. such a cliche. That- it is. And for and for many reasons, we all do different things, you know, mm-hmm. and whether it's because we're kids and mum's making us or because, you know, we discover a passion for rocks or something in our in our in our lifetime, um, we are all going to be have bring particular sort of passions and particular interests to to everything we do and so um she does that as well and as mm. as you say like it you need the character to be three dimensional you need it you need a character to have strengths you need a character to have weaknesses and then you're going to sort of challenge the strengths and exploit the weaknesses so when it comes to that scene where she has to stroll into a party full of older kids you know um and she's not particularly socially you know adept she she has to really draw on that sort of the courage of of other characters that she's read about to make her go forward and also just this overwhelming sort of loyalty that she has to this friend of hers to get in there and actually try to do something about this situation i when i go to school visits i say to kids you know if you if you set a character up to be shy or you set them up to be um you know whatever they are there's for them not to be that, there's got to be a really, really good reason. And often someone else is that reason because we will do things for other people that we will not do for ourselves. And I think it's, you know, so you've, you've got to create those sorts of relationships where um, it makes sense for your character to do something, you know, for someone else. Yes, agree. I'd love to read the start of the novel, Al, just so that the writers who are listening can see how you went about getting that opening into place. Yeah, of course. All right. If normal everyday houses retained the memories and ghosts of everyone who'd ever lived in them, what did that mean for holiday houses? As her parents piled bags and plastic boxes onto the steep driveway, Callie sat unmoving in the back seat of the car, staring at the 1970s two-storey dark brown brick house that lay at the bottom. It was called In the Rip and was the holiday house they rented every year in Sawyer's Point with two other families. How many thousands of game nights, pizza parties, fish and chip feasts, family movies, fights and eek romances had it witnessed? Did you remember the beach towels, her mother's voice, tight and shrill, broke into Callie's thoughts? Callie tensed as she heard her father mumble something in response, but neither parent came to her door. She turned her thoughts to the holiday house once more. So many people had spent a tiny part of their lives here. Did that mean they left a tiny part of themselves behind forever? Which part? If you just move everything to the grass, I'll move the car up onto the street, Dad said, the clunk of the car boot closing, punctuating his words. All right, then, Callie's mum said with a big huffing sigh, but I don't see why we always end up on the street. Shouldn't the lanes park there? They're the last ones here, as usual. We always park on the street, Callie's dad said, as Callie knew he would. If there was one thing her dad liked, it was tradition. And the tradition was that when the three families gathered at the holiday house, the McGee's parked on the street, the Kensington Kensington's parked on the grass and Mr Lane's big four-wheel drive went in front of the garage doors right at the bottom of the driveway. Callie suspected that her dad was secretly happy with the arrangement because it meant he didn't have to reverse up the hill to the street every time he wanted to go somewhere. Come on Calliope Jean said her mother sounding irritated get out of the car I know you're annoyed with us but you can still help carry some of this stuff. Callie Callie said, making no move to grab the bag tucked beside her on the seat, trying to keep her voice calm. Remember, I asked you to call me Callie. Her mother exhaled sharply. Oh, for heaven's sake. Again, I ask why you would want 
to have such a common nickname. I didn't give you a unique, beautiful name to have it changed on a whim. It was the same argument they'd been having all the way from Sydney, two hours down the coast on the world's most boring highway. Callie didn't budge from her seat. You're the one who named me after old ladies, she said. Nana and Gran don't mind. In a few short weeks, Callie would be starting at Birchwood High with the Kensington and Lane kids. And if they were all caught calling her Calliope Jean from day one, she'd be Calliope Jean, super nerd from Luckmore Primary until the end of time. Being Calliope Jean meant being expected to have the answers in class. It meant always being held up to other students as an example. It meant being left out of the giggling conversations with the other girls and always being chosen last for sport. This week was the one chance Callie had to change that, to start high school as someone else. In Calliope Jean's wildest dreams, she'd be CJ, CJ McGee. Ow, that's just a bloody masterclass in how to open a middle grade novel. I reckon you've given us setting in a couple of fabulous sentences there with the Holiday House. You've given us an insight into mum being a little bit of an anxious, nervous Nelly. You've given us an insight into dad who's a little bit casual and yeah. she'll be right, mate. And then into Kelly and that main setup. It's the start of her character journey, isn't it? And that's in three pages. Yeah, well, it was. Look, it's one of those things that it's in the editing always because you want to make sure that all a all of those things are clear. The other thing I needed to make sure that I got in here, and this was where I realised I'd started in the wrong place, is that I needed to set the families up. I needed to say that there were, you know, two other families. I needed to say, you know, that what the because I think you tell a lot about the relationship between those three families by where the cars go. Um, because there's a lot of characters in this book. There's a lot of characters in the opening, like when they're all in the house together and everybody's like carrying on, um, there's a lot going on. And so to bring a young reader into that without some kind of setup is just too confusing. And that's what I realised when I first, when I read it, um, having started it, you know, that little tiny bit later, I realised it was too confusing to dive straight into the melee of all of those families. I needed to make sure that, the reader knew um, who was who and who was coming and had some expectation of what to expect um, once they sort of got there. So, um, yeah, it's the start of the holiday and it, it brings the setting. It shows us where Callie is and what she's sort of thinking. And she's, a, as I said, she's a thoughtful girl. There's a fair bit of internal um, narrative with her because it's a lot about her sort of working through what she's seeing and what she's hearing and what she's thinking. Um, and you want to do that without it being overwhelming. So it's about sort of like fitting it into the action as well. Yeah, so so we have Callie's sort of inner character journey of her wanting to become this sort of braver person. And she's got this deadline, which I, I love that <laughs> device, right, because it's Always. the start of high school, right? Yep, absolutely. Put <laughs> a clock on it. If you want to raise the stakes of anything that you're doing, particularly in middle grade, put a clock on it. It's the best way to make the stakes higher straight away. Yeah, and the other way you raise the stakes on that is that she's, and you've brought that up in the first couple of pages as well in the opening is that she's going to be going to school with the kids who are with coming the on the holiday. So they exactly. know who yep. she is. They've always known who yep. she is. So she's yep. got this other. Yep. Exactly. And it, it, it's so like, there is no worse place to reinvent yourself than when you are surrounded by people who know you so well. It's one of the reasons why most kids will wait till the end of high school and move away and then, you know, blossom into whatever social butterfly they were, you know, always meant to be um, because it's hard. And sc the school environment is so incredibly difficult because the minute you start doing anything different to what you were doing before, you know, everyone's jumping on you in a second, aren't they? So she's just, she's, it's like a microcosm of that school environment that she's in because she's not with family. She's She's with family, friends. And so, you know, her parents are like, it's like, these are the closest things you'll ever have to siblings. And Callie's sitting there thinking, do, do actual siblings dislike each other this much sometimes? You know? Yes. Yep. The yes, answer Callie, to that is do. yes. <laughs> yes, Callie, they do. <laughs> so you make us feel really invested in what's happening to Callie. And uh, and the other two characters I would say that I, I'm very invested in are Sasha, mm -hmm. who's the older girl, and Owen, who's the cousin of one of the boys, the family yes. friends that comes along. That's and right. Owen's so sweet. I loved Owen. He's just gorgeous. He kind of takes Callie's side. He's got a bit of bookish about him as well. 
I think he recognizes in her a kindred spirit. Yes. And he has grown up with Mitch too. So he knows mm. what Mitch is like. Mitch, Mitch is, is a like, little devil. He's just like that loudmouth kid who's, you know, always going to be causing trouble everywhere he goes. He's great though, Mitch, because he's a he's a pusher. Like he's he provokes action. You need characters like that. But the other thing I love about Mitch is that he provokes action and then when he's in the middle of it, he's like, you know what? I'll just be over here. Um, I'll be the, you know, <laughs> someone needs to be the lookout, right? Um, and I, I like that aspect of, you know, that sometimes the outward, you know, the loudest person is not always the most courageous and the loudest person is not always the leader. That was the other thing that I kind of like liked about that dynamic that came through. Um and I think Owen and and Callie are just sort of like recognizing each other right from the beginning. Like, cause she she's so flawed by this idea when she's first introduced to him because Mitch is teasing Owen also about, you know, reading all the books. Um, and she's so flawed by this notion of boys reading books, you know, that she's that she's sort of like a bit taken aback and she kind of follows him around a little bit, like he's some kind of science experiment for a while. And then they, you know, get to know each other quite well. And she also, you know, comes to understand that Owen's got a lot going on in his life at that time and that he's um you know, sympathy for her is possibly an extension of his own feelings of being a little bit adrift and a bit alone at that point. So, um, yeah, I, I like the fact that they kind of find each other. I also like the fact that they find each other as friends. Maybe, you know, like a, there's a hint that maybe down the track there might be more, but they're friends. And I wanted that for them to be friends. I loved all of that that layered aspect of the characters' journeys. But then, you know, you've obviously got to have a bit of a, an external plot going on, which is yes. the story of the break-ins. Yes. How do you get that balance right in a middle grade novel between the touchy-feely character journey stuff that's all relatable and we can all feel it and then this external plot that's going to get our heart racing like, is that a ghost at the end of the street and who's responsible and they're having a look in this person's garage and, you know, are they going to get caught? And so you've got all that gripping stuff going on as well. How do you get that balance right? I think the thing important thing to remember with middle grade um, in particular is the story is the key. You, you have to have a story. Like it's, it's, I think it's one of the reasons that I write middle grade as well, because it, it was this here where I found my storytelling voice. Like I was writing for adults, but I was so caught up in what I wanted to say and in the, inter, the sort of internal narrative and the character development and all that, that I, I failed to focus on the fact that there needed to be a plot. Um, and I had plots, but they were contrived plots. They weren't coming out of the character's decisions and the character's journeys and things. And there was something about writing for, yeah, for, for middle grade, writing for a reader. So I, when I first started writing um, with the Mapmaker Chronicles, you know, I was thinking about my own boys who were nine and six at the time. And somehow in writing that style of story, I it freed me up to write a story. It freed me up to remember that in actual fact, what you love about books is the story. It's the action and all of the other stuff builds into the story and makes the story memorable and is the, re you know, you get invested in the character and that's why you, why you want to continue. But I read crime fiction. Like that's what I love to read. And I have always loved it. I read mystery stories since I was a kid. Um, and I'd read them because I love a strong story. So um, the the idea of wrapping that mystery in and always and it's also fantastic for giving you the structure that you need like you if they are attempting to solve a mystery you've got certain things that have to happen along the way and you're trying to think really hard about how, how to hide your clues and you know your red herrings and all of that sort of stuff so it's it gives you that really strong framework um to to sort of hang your story off and it's a framework that i understand incredibly well, despite my non-planning self, because I have read 8 million of them. And so, you know, you sort of instinctively understand where the beats of a story like that need to be and what needs to happen. And um, and so, I think that for me, the mystery aspect, like there's a mystery in in all of my stories, like whether they are actually like branded as detective slash mystery stories or not, there are mysteries and puzzles at the heart of all of them. And I, it's because that's where my natural structure goes. It's what I like to write. It's what I like to read. Always write what you like to read. <laughs> Just makes your job hot, so much easier. <laughs> hot tip, people. <laughs> hot tip. <laughs> but, yeah, I knew that um, the, the sort of 
the holiday houses were being broken into, I knew that I would need at least a, you can't just have the one suspect, you know, you've got to have at least two or three suspects and they all have to be viable. They have to be up until a certain point viable. So you kind of got to have different, you know, different, uh, introduce different people and different angles um, so that, uh, so that your 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 detective, in this case Callie and Owen, um, and to a lesser extent Mitch, Mitch. <laughs> um, have something to investigate. And as soon as they start investigating stuff, they're going places and they're doing things and suddenly you've got a story. It's all happening. Did you have any moments in the editing where you thought, oh, I actually need to drop in a, a red herring or a clue here? Did, oh, that, yeah. did a lot of that happen in the editing? Yeah, always. Like yeah. the main beats of the story are there, but then it's like, okay, that's too obvious. I need to think about how I can, you know, fix that. The The entire ghost angle came about in, I think, it wasn't in the first draft at all. Um, so it sort of came out in, I, I think it was probably the, the first major edit. It The story was there. Um, and, and then... Oh, and I ain't saying that. The story was there from the first draft because of the conversation, um, but I strengthened it a lot by actually having them go and, and looking and Kelly spots, you know, what she thinks might be the ghost and um, because, you know, she finds herself outside alone in the dark for the first time in her life. Um, and I have to say I love that scene where she recognises she has to go and do something by herself and she – recognises that, A, she's terrified, but also that she is the freest that she has ever been in her life because she's on this street, the wind is blowing, it's a beautiful night. Yes, there's tech, possibly a ghost out there, but, you know, no one knows where she is. No one's at her and she just loves that feeling. And I remember that feeling from when I was in New York. I was travelling when I was in New York and um, I was probably about 22, so I was older. But I just remember walking down a street. I was walking down Fifth Avenue and this is, you know, well before mobile phones and all that sort of stuff and just thinking to myself, no one in the world knows where I am. And it was just the most delicious feeling that I had ever had in my life. And so I tried to bring that into, you know, what Callie was feeling there on that, on that headland. Gosh, you've just taken me back to my travelling days. <laughs> Free mobile phones. How did you do it? Shh, let's not even talk about it because it just instantly ages us. <laughs> right. Those blue airmail. Yeah. <laughs> Aerograms. Aerograms. Yes. used to send yes. them to your parents. Oh, Absolutely. I do. So I guess because you're so experienced now, pacing's not really an issue for you, but what would you say to people who want to write middle grade in terms of pacing? Is there a certain chapter length or scene length that, you know, speaking of aging us, we didn't have scattered attention spans, but um, <laughs> kids these days, we've got to keep them reading. We want to keep that pace cracking along. How do you do that? Well, it depends what you're writing as well. Like the first summer of Callie McGee is a shorter book, so the chapters are shorter. I think the longest one in there is probably about three and a half thousand words. But in my Mapmaker Chronicles and other books, they're up to about 5,000 because they're longer books and they're just longer. But they're always broken up into like it's not – I don't do a chapter per scene. I do – there'll be – um, there's dinkuses through, even in the first summer of Callie McGee, there's these cute little the dinkuses all the way through. Yeah. Um, so I'll have time breaks within a chapter um, to sort of like move things along more quickly. Um, so a little a little scene break and then starting, you know, four hours later is a great way to make sure things keep, you know, going. Um, but pacing is not so much also about chapters. It's about – it is actually about scenes and paragraphs. It's about yes. – um, it's about making sure that you get people where they need to be as quickly as possible. Let's not spend eight hours walking down the beach when we can just open the scene at the beach. Let's do that. Um, it's about that. It's about when things are important, um, if, the, if big things are happening, um, even if you're out in the middle of the night, you know, chasing down burglars, take those moments where you come back inside your character and slow it down. If you slow something down, the reader knows that you ne they need to take notice. So, your, your sentences become slightly longer. It's it's more of a thought process. It's not going to go for three pages. It might only go for a paragraph, but it will feel to the reader like it's like, okay, I've slowed this down. Um, when I'm writing like a big scene, like a fight scene or a kiss or, a, you know, the scene where uh, Callie's confronting, you know, this group of kids on the beach, et cetera, um, I am so far back in her point of view. I am getting right inside her head. I want that scene 
the, the most important scenes. I want them to be, I want to know what she's feeling. I need to, I don't want to see that from the outside. I need to know exactly what she's feeling. And so in funny ways, the big scenes, the faster scenes, the action scenes are actually some of the slowest because you, you want to bring them out. You want to bring out the pacing of that in the, in the head, in the, um, inside their heads. I want to know what's going on. Um, so when I'm writing a fight scene or, I, and I do, like I've got battles going on in all, all my books, not this one, but others, um, I am writing it from the inside, not from the outside. I'm not like, you know, sword A hits sword B and then, you know, person D fell over. I'm not writing it like that. I'm writing it from the perspective of Quinn who's holding the sword and is feeling, you know, the clash up his arm. That's what I need to know. So pacing comes down to paragraphs and scenes as much as it does to chapter breaks. But when I get to the end of a chapter, I need to make sure that the reader wants to know more. It's always about making sure I break before I get to the end. So I'm going to break knowing that they are going to want to turn the page. You want to always end it before it's over, so to speak. So I'm just looking at that scene on the beach where Callie has had the confrontation with the older kids and you do want to find out the next day how she actually is feeling after that big After all of that, exactly. Yes. So the scene itself is that scene where they're on the beach is quite a long scene. Yes. She's, you know, she's noticing the wind. She's noticing the dry leaves and the dust. And, you know, um, Sasha's out on the rocks and it's taking her a long time to get back because she's in quite a precarious situation. Yes. So we, I, need the, I need the reader to know that that's what's going on. So in that sort of hyper aware state that you are in when you are anxious, she is, Callie's noticing everything. And that's, that's important because then the reader also notices everything. And you write these big scenes from the perspective of the person who has the most to lose. And yes. so, you know, in this particular scene, obviously Sasha is the one in trouble, but Callie is the one walking into the lion's den. Callie is the one who's appeared out of nowhere. They're telling her to go home. Mm. She's refusing to go home without Sasha. And she's really, you know, it's pretty stressful for her. And the two boys are watching from behind the levee, you know, like this. <laughs> They're just, yeah, good on your boys. Excellent. <laughs> but that was also a very specific thing to do as well because all of them turning up would have just caused yeah. a ruckus, like it would have caused a problem. So, yeah. yeah. So, it was the right it was the right tack to take. I love this. Kelly could barely breathe. Was her vague plan actually working? And then Jake is this older boy who's a bit menacing. Jake was staring at her as though trying to read her thoughts, arms still folded. The moonlight was so bright that Kelly could see a muscle clenching in his jaw. For a moment, it was as though the waves stopped pounding while everyone waited to see what Jake would say. And I loved that because it said so mm. much that she could yeah. see this muscle clenching in his jaw, that the waves seemed to stop pounding. And also that whole concept, I love the way you bring in all the senses there. Yes, building a big thinking. picture, building a big picture. Because, you know, mm. um, it's those small details that build the biggest pictures. Mm. And so you, you're you kind of wanting to, I wanted to make, you know, it's, again, it's that hyper-awareness. She's absolutely, because big kids to a 12-year-old, a 17-year-old boy is a really, really scary or, you know, potentially scary thing. Like it's it's the sort of thing where we you read it as an adult and you can see the very, you know, the many layers going on in this particular scene. Um, but you read it as a as a 12-year-old and you just, if all you need to understand is that he's 17, you know, or 18, 17, 18. And so she's, she's immediately the power dynamic there is just epic, you know, like she's immediately small and weak and really worried. And so, um, so it works on a couple of levels. It works from, you know, the adult reading it, reading it goes, Oh, this is not good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the 12 year old reading it also goes, Oh, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> I brought this up with Marcus Zuzak as well, is that concept of specificity, which is used to bring out the detail and make the reader feel like they're really present. And I feel like yes. you do that really well. Oh, thank you. Uh, Kelly doesn't just hide behind a bush at one point. A bit of the bush goes into her eye. <laughs> she pokes herself in there and she's got the tear. And we've all had that experience. We have. So it's like, yeah, why she's say, in the Grevilleas. Yeah. She's in the Grevilleas. So immediately I'm there. You tell me I, uh, Kelly's hiding behind a, a bush. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, but you tell yeah. me that Kelly got yeah. poked in the eye with the 
brand yeah, of the Gravilia. Yeah. I'm so there. You think so? <laughs> because we've all, I think I must have been weeding that day and probably <laughs> poked my eye out. I just kind of bring in the stuff that's happening to me at yes. the time. But You're yeah, in the skin of the character, in other words. Yeah, You're not absolutely. just viewing them from... No, and and that's where you want to be, and it's it's um I think it's important in any novel, and it's important in middle grade, and that's why you know it's a challenge to write it because you have to remember, you have to go into those places where you know where you were vulnerable, where you were ten and where you were twelve, and mm-hmm. uh, I spoke to Valerie Koo about this for um so you want to be a writer, and she was like the thing I find fascinating, Al, is that we were all there, but I try to avoid remembering it, and you're <laughs> diving into it, and it's like well. It's it's just um, if if I can by diving into that like the scene where she gets the lip gloss and you know everybody's like making fun of her because oh she's God. because she's wearing like who has not been in that situation mm. when you're sort of like you know you're you're, you're nearly thirteen you and then someone says you know something about becoming a woman and I was just like oh my that was probably just like verbatim from what someone said to me at that age but I remember it and it's just like that horrible self-consciousness where, you know, everything about you is changing and you can't do anything about it and you don't quite know what to do with most of it. And so, you're sort of trying desperately to control things that you can control and then um, and everyone's laughing at you. And it's this whole yeah. idea of how we see ourselves versus how other people see us. And I think um, that wrestle or, or how we would like to see ourselves and how other people see us, I think that wrestle is... I don't know. Do we ever grow out of that? I don't know if we do. No, not really. I don't know if we do. No. Now, you brought up setting before and not wanting to have big, long tranches of setting. I imagine that you have to balance that as well. So you said that you kind of tend to drip feed setting throughout. Yeah. Can we have a little reading and a bit of an example of that, Al? Sure. Um, I'll just read a bit. This is this particular bit helps to kind of uh, orientate where the house is in relation to the water and where it is in relation to the to the beach etc so this is Callie's gone in search of Sasha because uh, she's just had you know 18 conversations with parents which which she doesn't want to have anymore but Sasha's had a fight with her dad and she's taken herself off so she's gone to look for her and on her way down there, she runs into Mr. Nelson, who is the neighbour. Um, so this scene actually brings in a whole lot of different information that rolls out across the entire novel. I'm just on my way to put the ute away, Mr. Nelson went on. Can't leave it out in the salt air, you know, bad for the duco. I'll look in on your skateboarder over the fence. Hopefully he hasn't dinged that garage door. Hopefully, Callie agreed, crossing her fingers as he moved down the side of his own house towards the front. Nice to see you again. Walking to the edge of the mown grass, Callie looked up and down the coastal path that signalled the edge of the garden. There were no fences between the properties here, so nothing could interfere with the all-important view. Even so, all Callie could see were rocks and ocean, no Sasha. Walking across the path, she trudged down the long grass to the edge of the embankment that led down to the rocky coastline. The house was tucked into the wrong side of the headland, one of a row of ten that hugged a craggy inlet. On the other side of the headland, Nine Mile Beach stretched out like a crescent moon. Here it was all seaweed, oyster shells and sharp rocks with tiny sandy patches. The wind whipped Callie's curls about her face and the waves hit the rocks with a crash. Down below, Callie could see the top of Sasha's head bright against the dark rocks. She was sitting in a small patch of golden sand, staring out at the deep, dark, navy blue ocean. So she's looking for Sasha, but in the process of looking for Sasha, we get this like three paragraphs, which gives the orientation of the house, the beach, the headland, and then also what she's looking at, like what it looks like down there. So it's... um. I, I then don't have to repeat that information. Yeah, that's, that, exactly. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. When can I move there? Yeah. Oh, honestly, <laughs> you would want to move there. It's so beautiful. I've done that walk from around Jericho and Jeroa and Yeah, it's Kyle. beautiful. It's stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. So when you just said then the wrong side of the headland, I know what that means as an adult. Yeah. Maybe a middle yeah. grader wouldn't know what that means. So no. I'm very curious about whether you are writing a little bit for the parents as well. I mean, I know most most readers in that sort of 8 to 12 are probably reading independently. My daughter, she loves being read to. My oldest stepson, he loved being read to right up until the age of 13 and 14. So there are still parents reading these books out loud to Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Are you throwing little Easter eggs in there for the parents as well or...? 
It's funny. Um, I think it's more about I I have just never, ever written a book that I've dumbed down for kids, like ever. And I think that's one of the secret hallmarks of good middle grade fiction is you, you don't write you know, for kids per se in a, in that sort of like condescending sort of way. So I write the story as I, as the story comes out, as the story should be written. And always is that idea of it's, it's always going to be my writing voice, kids, but kids also repeat the things that they hear from their parents. So Callie, you know, this idea of her using that as a description, the wrong side of the headland, is the kind of thing that you hear, you know, and in actual fact. But, you know, I think the wrong side of the headland is actually the right side of the headland. Yeah, there, but, agree. <laughs> um, people pay like $8 million for the view down the beach, you know. So it's it's just that sort of idea. And I think um, it's not ever a conscious thing of, of parents being there. But I have also read a thousand books to my kids. And so my storytelling voice is always going to be in that this is the kind of story I would read to my kids or that I would tell my kids. And so it's always going to have my voice in it, even if I'm in the character's viewpoint, my voice is there. So, um, yeah, I, I, and I think that that's what it is. If I think a word is the right word and it's four syllables and the kid's going to need a dictionary, I, I still use it. The right word is the right word. And and I think that the kids actually really appreciate that too because it, it, it sort of – you can usually pick up what's going on from context, even without your dictionary, um, and it's only occasional. Like I, I always say to kids, you know, these are five dollar words, and we don't use them too often because you know you don't want to spend all your budget in one sentence. Um, but in high, it's a, if it's an impact word, and I think it's the right impact word, then I will use that impact word. And and I think that parents also appreciate that sort of like underlying sense of humour in some of you know what I'm you know writing about because. It's Green. always going to be my slightly jaded view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and if a child has to ask their parents what the wrong side of the headland means, then what a great conversation starter. Absolutely. And the wrong the wrong is in um well, is exactly. in quote marks. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. it's you know, yeah, but you're it's right. always it's, that implication. It's what kids hear and pick up it's what they hear yeah it's what you know you you'd be Mm. astonished what they you know when I go to schools and teachers will tell you the same thing kids go to school and repeat everything you say and some of the stuff that they come out with is not necessarily what you would want out there but that's the way of it now one of our listeners Louise Brooks had a question she says authors grow close to their characters did you write this novel with the possibility of a series in mind or as a standalone story and i was curious about that too thanks for your question by the way louise really that's a great that. question louise um so i think whenever i write anything i try to write a character that could go on because you know series series need characters that are big enough to go forward like that uh, that there's going to be enough interest in and enough growth and development in that you could actually continue that series if you if you wanted to so i don't think i consciously thought about this one as a series but it could be it's a mystery and so you know if i wanted to write a second mystery with callie and owen and mitch i i could most assuredly do that because the three of them are developed enough as characters i would need to obviously put it somewhere else it would need to not be sawyer's point i think we've kind of done that so i would take them elsewhere but um there's always an idea and i could write another mystery with those three in it you know tomorrow if i if i wanted to um so I'm not 100% sure. It's At this stage, it's a standalone um, and, you know, we'll see what happens next. It's- so that's so interesting, Al, because as I was reading it, I was thinking, well, they're all going to be at school together next year. So that's a nice new setting. Exactly. So there's always a setup, right? Like you're always going to be thinking about, okay, particularly when you're writing something like this, there's always this idea of um, – creating a situation where mm. it could go on if 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 it you know warranted if i came up with a mystery that i thought was strong enough or if my publisher said to me gosh this has done so extraordinarily well let's do more um i would definitely be able to do that and and i think that's you know it's about it's always going to be about the character. It's yeah. always going to be about making that sort of dynamic available to you going forward into um, into other stories. Well, I've already workshopped that for you, Al. <laughs> I, I need to know 
how Kelly is accepted at high school. <laughs> we want to know the how the name has taken we on. We want to know how she goes, don't we? It was like with the Maven and Reef mysteries, like I created that world and that world full of intrigue and politics and um and these two incredibly strong characters. Um when I first when I wrote the first mystery, there was no second mystery. Um, but I knew that there was enough scope in that world and enough scope in those characters. I could write twenty Maven and Reeve mysteries. Like they they could go on for days, for years. Do it. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it's 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 the business though, isn't it? Like I've got the ideas, but it's all about the business. Yeah. Kelly could be the Trixie Belden of the twenty twenties. <laughs> I'm would. telling you. Al. Do you think they'll all be out in Bob White's jackets before they know it? I can imagine <laughs> it, can't you? But also, I want to find out about Owen. You know, his his parents have got a situation going on. I want to know about his mum. Absolutely, would love, love to know about his mum. Um, so there's a lot. To, there's a lot to work with there. So all right. So everybody just has to go and buy the first summer of Kelly. Go and buy it, and the more people buy it, the better chance we have of getting to know more about Kelly and her friends. Sell all Absolutely. the books. People sell all the books, and you can do what you want. Elastic will say, <laughs> "Alison Tate, we need another Kelly McGee stat <laughs> <Yeah>, right now." <laughs> yeah, in three minutes, and I'll be like, "What?" <laughs> Um, now, I know you've given some great tips over at So You Want to Be a Writer, just a, that little podcast. You probably don't know much about it. Al, did you get to know Valerie? <laughs> well, you know, we didn't spend that much time together, I but know. Yeah, it was fine. And you, I did listen to that interview and you've given some top tips over there, which I think was your invention for the for that podcast. It was my invention. And then she asked me to give the three top <laughs> tips and I was sitting there going, could have warned me about this, Val. But do you have any really practical tips for aspiring middle grade writers? Yes. Well, you know, everybody that ever is asked this question says read. Yes. And, you know, I'm going to say that because I'm going to say that if you want to write middle grade, you actually have to read middle grade. You can't rem- you can't rely on Trixie Belden. You can't rely on what you read as a kid. You're obviously, that's in your DNA and it's in your writing subconscious and you're going to draw on that anyway, but you can't rely on that because, you know, kids, things have moved on. Uh, That's a long time ago now that they were first published and um, kids today just have different expectations about what books are going to be. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot more impact of screenwriting on novels today, even though like novels are always going to be novels, but there's always going to be that idea that you are dealing with a screen generation. And so there are certain beats and expectations that, that um, you, you just, you're better off attempting to fit a little bit. You don't have to like, you know, get out of a beat sheet, but um, you've got to have that in mind. And the other thing I would say is to, when you're writing for middle graders is to read um Read nonfiction. Like, look at what's being published in nonfiction for middle graders at the moment, because it will tell you a lot about what kids are interested in, and you're always going to be drawing on those sort of weird passions and quirks and things like that. Um, that. You, you can put into your own books. Your characters have to be realistic to kids today. So they need to be interested in the kinds of things that kids today are interested in. And so if you look at the nonfiction stuff that kids are reading, it gives, and that's being published and selling well, it gives you an idea of, of what those kids, you know, what your audience is, is, you know, possibly interested in and therefore what your characters can also be interested in. They're not all interested in Instagram and TikTok. Like it's not, you don't have to immediately go down that social media path. That would be my second tip actually would be um, it's very, very difficult to incorporate social media into middle grade. I've I found it was one of the biggest challenges of of writing this contemporary mm. novel was technology. It was also about permissions and you know perceived permission and expected permission, because most social media channels, you know, you have to be thirteen to be um, a member. Technically, every eight year old you know has got Instagram, <laughs> but that's not necessarily a great thing or or TikTok or whatever. But if you don't understand those things, don't write about them because you will get them wrong. Like if you're not immersed in that world, like those kids are immersed in that world, it is too easy to get it wrong. So think about ways that you can get around that. And for me, you know, Callie's mum was just a gift because she doesn't have any of those things on her phone. She's not allowed to have, she's got a not <laughs> a not very smartphone. <laughs> um, and it, it, it it's, that was a really specific choice for me because I, or A, 
wanted her to not be that kid that was on Instagram all the time. But I also wanted that difference between between her and Sasha. I wanted that two-year difference between her and Sasha to be really obvious. Um, so if you're going to play around with that stuff, you've got to understand it. Don't, don't just assume that, you know, 12-year-olds are on Instagram because they're not necessarily. And the way that they are is probably different to the way that you're reading about in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it's it's they use it really differently. Most of them are only using the comments. Uh, sorry, the messaging aspect of it, and they'll have a weird one weird photo, and that'll be it. You know, um, so be really across that stuff and understand the boundaries of it. Not only for the characters, but also for the readers, because um, again, depending on what age group you're aiming for, parents have expectations about that. So, I know that's quite a specific tip. No, that's good. The <laughs> more specific, the better. I think. Yeah, because it is it is very much something that you have to think about. It is one of the reasons that I find fantasy easier. Um, yes, I have to create entire <laughs> hierarchical structures and monetary systems. It's a lot of work, Al, too. <laughs> there's a lot going on there, but nonetheless, no technology. in some ways, <laughs> trying to do, yeah, like when the, when the most up-to-date technology you have is, you know, the horse and cart, <laughs> things are a lot easier. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, and the other thing I would say to you, too, is that if you are researching uh, for middle-grade novels, um, and you need to know stuff. So this would tie more into my fantasy sort of stuff. But if I'm researching, I type in, you know, um, castle plans for kids or I type in medieval history for, for kids. kids or uh, how to be a squire for kids yes. and I get the kid-friendly version. Like so I'm going to get the amount of detail that I need without too much else. Um, and I mean, obviously, you've got you, you need to go across a whole range of different sources. But when you're looking for just the the little telling details that are going to be important for what kids are going to understand about the world you're creating, that for kids is a really important part of your Google search. That, that's a, such a good tip. I did hear you say to Val that another really good thing to do is to jump onto your kids' next read, which is your podcast that you have. Definitely. Tell us about that because that's also a good resource for middle grade novelists, isn't it? Absolutely. If you are writing for children on any level or any capacity or you are a parent or you are a teacher or whatever. Um, So we have a podcast called Your Kids Next Read and we have a Facebook community called Your Kids Next Read and we now have a newsletter called Your Kids Next Read. But what it will do for you as a writer is it will show you, A, what people are looking for. It will show you comparison titles to whatever it is that you think that you are writing, um, which is important when it comes time to submit. It will show you what you should be reading in that space um, because you want to read the stuff that people are currently recommending because that will give you an idea of what's resonating with young readers and with their parents and booksellers and teachers and teacher librarians. Um, It's a great way to just learn about like the industry as a whole because we're always talking about different aspects. Uh, We talk to authors every second episode we do and it's only a 10 to 15 minute interview. It's short, um, it's sweet and I focus in on the one thing that I think is important about that particular conversation Um, and it's supposed to be 10 minutes and it never is. I'm just going to say that. You get value for money with AL tape people. Oh, you do. There's no don't no denying that you get extra <laughs> value add. Um, so yeah, so it's it's if you are in that space or interested in learning more about that space, then I think your kids next street is a great resource. We we are really proud of the way it all, you know, works and comes together. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I've jumped on there many, many a time when, you know, reluctant reader, 10-year-old yes. girl. There it boom. is. Exactly. Your website is also an excellent resource for writers Absolutely. of all persuasions. Uh, a massive amount of information for writers on there across every kind of craft aspect yes. you could ever want to <laughs> search upon. Go to alisontape.com. That's Alison with a double L. A double L I S O N T A I T dot com. People can search. Excellent stuff. And I also have an online writing group that you can join uh, if you like. I run it through Facebook um, and, you know, email and stuff. There's two Zooms a month, one with me, one with an industry insider. And um, it's, you know, we're in the middle at the moment of a writing challenge where we're, you know, writing 6,000 words in 31 days along with some other creativity challenges. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm there to answer questions and I'm there to give advice and information, um, you know, in real time more or less. So if you're interested, uh, you can find details of that. It's called Write with Alison Tate, but you'll find it on my website as well. 
Al, this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you for going into so much depth and detail on this novel and sharing your wisdom with us. And on behalf of all writers everywhere, probably around the globe, thank you for your many years of service to the writing community, oh, Al. Seriously, you. you are an absolute I have been, legend and a gem. And I have been banging on about writing for a long time. You haven't have. I? And <laughs> I thank you on behalf of writers everywhere. Thank oh, you. thank you so much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> now off you go and um, workshop the second summer of Callie McGee, will you? I'll get on that immediately <laughs> just for you. Thank you for that. There you go, Al Tate. Apart from all the fabulous middle grade info, I also loved what she said about the importance of blogging and how it can help you find your fiction writing voice, but also as a marketing tool. And I completely agree with her. As many of you know, my day job is website designer to authors. And I always recommend if writers do have the time and the headspace to start a blog, it can be a really great thing to do for your author platform and for your author marketing. So in the biz, blogging is part of something we call content marketing. So that also includes things like YouTube videos, podcasts, social media, newsletters, and so on. Essentially, it's the really relevant, helpful content as opposed to the more sales oriented content. Um, Google loves blogs because they help answer the questions that people are searching for. And that's what Google lives for, right? People search for things, Google provides the answers. So if you're helping to provide those answers, Google loves you. So for example, Alison has written a blog post called five tips for finding your writing voice. Google's like, great, let's send all the people who are searching for how do I find my writing voice over to Al's blog. So have a think about starting a blog on your website as part of your author marketing toolkit. Like I said, if you have the time, the headspace, and it's not taking you away from your actual writing. Speaking of Al's blog, you'll find it on her website. Um, I've popped links to her website, her socials, the writing group membership that she mentioned, Write with Alison Tate. And I've also popped in a link to her Your Kids Next Read podcast and links to buy her novels, all in the show notes of the podcast app that you're listening to now, or you can head over to my website at writersbookclubpodcast.com. And I highly recommend you do. Alison's blog is full of so much writing gold, great advice. So get over there and fall down the Alison Tate rabbit hole. Okay, it's time to reveal my September guest. Another interview the interviewer moment for me. The exceptionally talented Kate Mildenhall. I've been wanting to have Kate on the podcast for ages. Many of you will know her from her writing podcast, The First Time, which she co-hosts with Catherine Collette. But did you know she also teaches creative writing and is currently doing her PhD in creative practice at RMIT in Melbourne? So clever. So yes, Kate is definitely someone who knows a thing or two about writing craft. We're going to be doing a deep dive into her brand new novel, The Hummingbird Effect. And oh my goodness, this book. If you are wanting to experiment with structure and voice and character and timelines, this is really going to float your boat. Kate is also just an accomplished and beautiful writer. So it's just got everything. Let me tell you about the book. The Hummingbird Effect is an epic kaleidoscopic story of four women connected across time and place by an invisible thread and their determination to shape their own stories. In 1933, Peggy is just starting out in life. She is one of the lucky few with a job during the Depression. She's a bagging girl at the Anglis Meatworks, a place buzzing with life as well as death, where the gun slaughter man Jack has caught her eye and she his. How is her life connected to Hilda's almost a hundred years later, locked inside during a plague or the life of La further on again in time? She's a singer working shifts in a warehouse as her eggs are frozen and her voice is used by AI bots, let alone Maz far removed into the future, diving for remnants of a past that must be destroyed. Are they connected by the river that runs through their stories, eternal yet constantly changing or by the mysterious hummingbird project and the great question of whether the march of progress can ever be reversed. Propulsive, tender and engrossing, this genre-bending novel is a feast for the heart as well as the mind and senses. For fans of David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, 
Michelle DeCretz's The Life to Come, and Jennifer Egan's The Candy House, it confirms Kate Mildenhall as one of the most ambitious and dynamic writers in the country. And I wholeheartedly concur with that sentiment. This novel really blew me away. It's the kind of novel you can't stop thinking about for weeks afterwards, and I'm so looking forward to talking to Kate about her writing process for it. You can buy a copy of The Hummingbird Effect wherever you get your books. I've also put a link in the show notes, which you can tap on straight out of whichever podcast app you're listening to, or over on the Writers Book Club podcast website. As always, I'm giving away a copy of the novel, this time with thanks to Simon and Schuster. Entries are now open, so head over to Instagram or Facebook to enter. All you have to do is follow the podcast on socials and tag a friend. You'll find us at Writers Book Club Pod on Instagram and Writers Book Club Podcast on Facebook. That's it for this month. Thank you so much for listening. I'm recording on the beautiful, unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation, where I'm lucky enough to live and work. I look forward to catching up with you again next month. Until then, happy writing. Happy writing.